No. Got it yet? All right. Well, good morning. Welcome to uh, Redeemer. Thrilled that you guys are here and thanking God for another uh, beautiful Sunday morning in the fall um, that we can be here and and join together. Uh, do any of you need worship folders? You can raise your hands. We got some. Everybody got one? Okay, well, if you need one, uh, just raise your hand and the uh, guys will bring one around for you. We have a few uh, announcements for uh, our life in the body um, yeah, that I'd like you to take note of. Next, um, next Sunday, we're going to have a meeting, afterwards congregational meeting, and we've got a few things to decide on. We've got the third quarter surplus what to, we're going to need to vote on the recommendation to put 25% of that to the general fund and 75% of that to the technical fund uh, for all the stuff that we're doing in this COVID time. So please make a note of that and members stick around to uh, talk about that. And then we have this other little matter of um, voting on Brian Hoke becoming part-time staff member. And if I might say the reviews are mixed on this guy. So I've met him, I think he's nice, but I've heard if you talk to his wife, Holly, you know, you might, no, I'm just kidding, just trying to <clears throat> deal with the awkward situation of announcing my own vote. So, um, but we are going to vote on that next week as well and on some of the stuff that needs to take place for that. So, so please uh, make a note of that and keep that um, on your calendar for next week. Another thing is you might have seen that the Redeemer Rangers survey came around. So if you have uh, kids, elementary kids in your family, please fill that out and get it back to Lisa. Uh, she's gotten a few responses, but she'd like to have some more as to what uh, we can actually implement and how we can actually go about this, uh, starting up uh, Redeemer Rangers again here soon. So uh, take that survey and, um, and get that off to her so she's got some, some good info to work with. And then just one more reminder. It's a beautiful morning this morning, but that's no guarantee for next week. So please uh, be watching towards the end of the week for any communication that's coming from the deacons as to time and place and and how we're going to deal it if, if the weather um, is going to be a little bit different next sunday so please keep a watch out for that and now please let's uh, join me in prayer please as we go before the lord i'll be using david's prayer out of first chronicles may you be praised Lord God, from eternity to eternity. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty. For everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom and you are exalted as head over all. Riches and honor come from you and you are the ruler of everything. For power and might are in your hand, and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. And so therefore, our God, we give you thanks, and we praise your glorious name. And we acknowledge, Lord, that as we read this prayer and we come here, we, we need this time that we're gathered here to worship you but we live in a world that denies all of these things. We live in a world that has chosen to believe that the stuff that we see, the stuff that we walk on and touch is all that the reality that there is. I pray, Lord, that as this is the air that we breathe conceptually that influences how we think, that this time this morning will convince our hearts and our minds that there is something beyond, and it is you, that you are the great and glorious one who exists from all time. Lord, we live in a world that says that riches and honor are those to the, belong to those who go after it and grab it. And our lives so often are taken up with making ends meet or amassing wealth or 
trying to get what we want. And we fail to realize that your presence is the true shalom. That all these things will pass away and that, as Jesus said, this night our lives will be required of us. That's going to be true for all of us. And we need to realize the fleeting temporal nature of worldly things that so easily grab our hearts. And so, Lord, as we gather here this morning, we need to have that impressed upon us. May your spirit drive into our hearts that what we worship here this morning, you and your son, that is our true inheritance. And Father, perhaps most of all, the quintessential sin, we want control. We do not want to give you power and might and ascribe to you the glory and the strength that is due you. That Adam and Eve grabbed that fruit symbolic of the question of who will be God. We wrestle with it all the time too, Lord. As we come here, may our hearts bow. May our minds submit to the fact that you are God, we are not. You control all, and your goodness and your benevolence is what makes our lives worthwhile. Help us to submit because of what you've done through our son, or through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, may we focus upon him this morning. We need to have our hearts and minds renovated so that we might become living sacrifices in imitation of our Lord and Savior who gave himself for us. Lord, there's so many needs that we could bring. I'd like to just mention a few as we begin for Paul Hurst Sr. yesterday as he had another seizure and fell. Lord, apparently losing some speech and having Patty find him and, and all of the stress and shock on her. We pray for that couple and for Paul and Tara. Lord, may your grace, may your comfort through your spirit, may your endurance be powerful and tangible in their lives as you minister to them through your spirit, through your word, and through your people. Lord, please grace them in this difficult time. I pray, Lord, for the Pandes in Nepal as they've taken on a few more foster children. Lord, give them strength in that. And especially now as they navigate that in the midst of, of coming back to the States to go to school, to further their ministry there, and to equip them. Lord, provide for them. Uh, provide for these children who are going to be taken care of by their college-age sibling. I pray that that will uh, be graced by you and that they might grow in their knowledge of you. Lord, I pray for all of the logistical things of of moving back here so that Laurel can get some Bible education and Paulus can go to uh, Gordon Conwell. Lord, provide and guide in that situation. I pray too for our world with the COVID complications. Some of us have loved ones who have been deeply affected by this. We've seen our nation affected by it. Lord, the ethos of our nation is deeply affected by this. I pray that it will cause us to look to you and not to the structures of this world. I pray that it will cause us to love. I pray for healing for those that we know and love who have been affected by this. And Lord, in this regard, I pray for the upcoming elections. I pray for the leaders of our country. I pray for this confirmation of a justice this, that's going to start this week. Lord, we know that you are the king, that ultimately this world is a monarchy. And I pray that you will superintend with your power. We don't know long term, Lord. We, we have a problem seeing what's going to happen past the next couple of hours. And sometimes we don't even know that. But you do. I pray that you will rule. I pray that you will overrule in all of these things 
so that the ultimate end of human affairs will be the acknowledgement and the glorification of you and of who you are, the lifting high of your son who gave himself for your creation. Father, I pray for Eric Freeland's employee, Zach, with the lung tumor. Lord, as he has a fearful waiting for that um, prognosis, I pray that you will give Eric the opportunity to minister to him. I pray that you'll bring healing to that young man. The same with Kyle, Phil Lodges, cousin who had this terrible fall and has these fractures. Lord, bring healing to him too, I pray. Lord, as we now move into worshiping you, hearing your word read, singing, Lord, I pray that you will do, as I had mentioned before, allow our minds to submit, allow our hearts to rejoice in your glory, not ours. May we focus upon you. May we focus upon Jesus and what he did for us. And I pray this in his name. Amen. Psalm 57, 7 through 11. My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Amen. Let's sing together to our God. He is exalted. in your order of worship, we turn our attention from praising our God for the freedom we have in Christ. We also lament our selfish hearts and the suffering of our Christ. Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. 
Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he has, he has been pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Stand together now as we sing, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Alas, and 
our selfish hearts and the suffering of Christ, please join me in a prayer of confession. Father, these hymns are so powerful. They remind us of a Psalm 8, what is man that you are mindful of him? Why would you shed your blood for us to make sinful people your children? Lord, it, sin is has so deeply affected us. It's who we are. It's not just what we do. And yet you suffered for us, for sinner's gain, by sending your Son, by him becoming one of us. Lord Jesus, your sacred head was wounded for us. And we confess our need. We confess that we could not please you from hearts that are selfish and sinful. And we're so grateful for your death, for the fact that you did not leave us, but you came for us. And you have made us your children, beloved. Now we are the children of God. And it doesn't appear what we shall be, but we do know now there is no condemnation for us because we're in Christ Jesus. And so while we confess the nature of our hearts, it is with the great hope that you have begun the process at the cross and the empty tomb of renovating us and making us into the image of your Son. When someday, when we see you, our hearts will be cleansed in completeness. We shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And we praise you for this. Amen. You can be seated. We'll turn our hearts now and our minds to look at Christ's example of selfless love towards us. Listen from Romans chapter 6. Thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's turn our hearts and sing loudly of the gospel that we have all come to know through Jesus Christ our Lord.
stand. singing together about our king in all of his beauty.
mighty and powerful God, we give to you praise and glory for what you have done. You alone are worthy. You are great and powerful. God, we call many things in this world beautiful, but they are all a reflection of you and your beauty. And so we praise you and give you thanks that we as creatures, as failing and weak creatures, get to bring you praise. We recognize this is far from what you deserve, even as we just sang. Symphonies of angels cannot fulfill the praise that you deserve. And so we thank you that we get to join in that praise. God, as, as Dan comes forward to preach, we pray that you would continue to empower and enable him by your spirit. Please help him to proclaim your beauty and help us as listeners to hear and respond and agree and better understand what you are calling us to do and how we are expected to live in this world that is full of sin and error. God, please use Dan, use us, and we ask for your continued grace and favor in this time. Thank you once again, God, that you are worthy. We praise you for all these things. In your name, Jesus, amen. could turn with me in your Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll be reading our way all the way through the chapter, but especially focusing on the second half this morning. A few weeks ago, we worked our way through chapter 8, and as, um, as we discussed how love is more important than knowledge in relation to how we should live within the church, um, Remember, uh, remember back a couple weeks with me, and um, within the church there in Corinth, there was a conflict between two groups concerning eating meat that was sacrificed to idols. And Paul, at that time, showed us that love compels us to serve our brothers and sisters, those inside the church, before our knowledge of liberty grants us permission to exercise our rights. And here in chapter 9, we're just like the next verse, right? So that is the context of what's going on. He has just spoken uh, about inside the church how to prefer one another. Here in chapter 9, Paul is going to continue examining our rights and how they may be misused in relation to those in our community, those outside of our church. And the main point of our passage today is that we need to consider the rights we engage in from the perspective of the gospel's advance and be willing to abstain from those rights if it's helpful for those seeking God. Let me say that one more time. We need to consider the rights we engage in from the perspective of the gospel's advance. And we need to be willing to abstain from those rights if it would be helpful for those seeking God. Paul begins chapter 9 by considering his freedom and rights as an apostle. So let's, um, let's look in chapter 9, and I'm going to read just the first 14 verses to get us up to where we're going to spend most of our time. Chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and, and Caiaphas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have, the right, have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out grain. 
Is it for the oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Paul is, is making a really clear argument here, arguing that those who preach the gospel have the right to be compensated um, for serving the body. And he initially draws from examples in secular life like soldiers or farmers, shepherds, right? Um, receiving compensation for their efforts from the work that they're doing. Then he turns in verse 8 to the Old Testament and he shows that the same principle recurs there in relation to oxen eating from the grain that they're, they're treading out. And this principle applies to the priests as well. He's showing this just this consistent principle, Right? And he concludes this set of verses with the affirmative, in the same way the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Paul here is referencing Jesus' teaching in Luke chapter 10, verse 7. And Jesus is sending his disciples out to minister to the towns that are in front of them, sending them out two by two, and he instructs them to carry no money bag. Among, among other instructions, he tells them, don't take any money with you. And when you find a house to stay in, in Luke 10, 7, it says, and remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. So this is the Lord's teaching on the same subject. So Paul here is asserting that he has the right to be compensated for his labor in the gospel, uh, especially like the other apostles. Paul is going to take this now, um, he, he's made this assertion about his right, and now he's going to talk about how he deals with that right in relation to, um, to outsiders, to people that are outside of the church. And Paul's going to show how exercising his right could hinder the gospel, and abstaining from his right to this compensation uh, could help the gospel. So that the church in Corinth and Redeemer Bible Church in Brighton can learn the proper perspective to have when we consider exercising or abstaining from our rights. All right, so that's kind of that's the plan this morning. That's where we're headed. So let's look first at Paul's warning that number one, exercising your rights could hinder the gospel. Exercising your rights could hinder the gospel. And I'm going to read verses 15 through 18. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I'm still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. In chapter 8, the Corinthians were complaining about not being able to eat meat offered to idols. But here, we see that Paul is willing to give up his material support. And that's a huge burden on Paul. Let's not underestimate that burden. Um, in order, he, he does all of this so that the gospel would not be hindered among the people in Corinth. Do we, do we recognize the contrast that he's even drawing here between the selfishness of wanting to do whatever they want to do and eat the meat that they want to eat and his unselfishness and sacrificial service even that he is willing to work to provide for his own food to provide for his own clothing and shelter. He's, able to, he's willing to work so that they don't have to compensate him. 
This causes Paul to work as a, as a tent maker, to pay for his own food and his clothes, while he's studying and teaching at the same time. But he doesn't want their financial support because that would deprive him for his ground for boasting, it says. And immediately, if you've been around the church for any length of time, right when he says that he, he wants to hold on to this right to boast, you're like, ooh, that doesn't sound good. And so we want to understand what he's talking about when he says he doesn't want to be deprived of this right that he has to boast, right? This, this grounds that he has for boasting. He feels so strongly about not receiving their support that he says he would rather die. And the grammar is actually pretty amazing here. Um, he, he breaks up. Um, He says uh, in verse 15, for I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. And in the original, it actually breaks right after than. For I would rather die than, and he like trails off, right? He doesn't even complete the sentence. And then he picks back up. And we don't know if he didn't want to complete the sentence or if he can't complete the sentence, but he's so emotionally charged when he says, I would rather die than have you support me. He's like, his sentences are even breaking up here. So he's really passionate about not being compensated by the church. And so we really need to understand what he's talking about here. So what boasting is Paul talking about? Can he, be, can he boast in preaching? Well, he's going to answer that question for us. He says, no, since he was called to preach, he can't boast in it because he's just fulfilling his duty. And he says that if he doesn't preach, uh, then it's actually a woe to him. Now, that's not a word that we use in everyday uh, English. Uh, we don't go to school, kids, and, and talk about our woes. Well, maybe if it's a test day. Um, but that woe is used to indicate great calamity. It's the most often translation. It's a great calamity. So he's saying that if he doesn't obey God's call, it would result in great calamity. He even explains that since his preaching isn't ultimately initiated by his will, but by God's will. Um, and he says in, in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2, that he's a slave of God, right? So it's God that's initiating all of this. Um, if if um, it's not initiated by him, then he has no right to, to, to boast about it. One hopeful, uh, helpful translation on this verse is the New Living Translation. Let me read just verse 17. It says, If I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment. But I have no choice, for God has given me this sacred trust. He, has, he, he, didn't, he didn't initiate this, right? God called him to this ministry, and so he doesn't deserve a reward here. He is just serving his master. Paul doesn't even get a reward for it because he is, he's just that he's the slave to God. Preaching the gospel uh, is not his reason to boast. He's, he's very, very clear through these 17 verses. It's not his reason to, bo- to boast. But in verse 18, he tells us, he tells us what his reason to boast is. He says, my reward is that my preaching, uh, let me just read it in here because I think I, I have a typo. He says, what then is my reward? that in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. So he says that his reward is that he can preach and that he may present the gospel free of charge. That's his reward. So some might say, well, that's kind of like saying my reward is no reward. And it kind of is. Paul's reward, his boast or his glory, is that he's not just fulfilling God's call, but he's doing it in a way that makes it very clear that the gospel is freely given. He is not charging a dime, and he's making that very clear, and he will not. He refuses. He said he'd rather die than take up an offering for himself, right? And so that's his reward. If, if Paul made use of his right to be compensated for preaching the gospel, he firmly believed that the gospel would be hindered. If we go back to verse 12b, it says, Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. He believes that if he collected, if he, if he took payment from the, the church there, that there would be an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. And we're going to get to kind of what is that obstacle. And I think we'll understand that in a bit. But we've looked at how the exercise of our rights can hinder the gospel. Now let's see what Paul says about abstaining from our rights. Okay, so if we, if we 
uh, exercise our rights, if Paul exercised that right to be paid, uh, then the gospel would be hindered. But since he's abstaining from it, then the gospel can advance. So number two, abstaining from your rights could aid the gospel. Abstaining from your rights could aid the gospel. And I'm going to read verses 19 through 23. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside of the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessing. All right, so we see him abstaining from his rights here. He starts here by referencing back to verse 1 from chapter 9 and talking about his freedom. In verse 1, he says that he has this freedom, and here he says, for I am free from all, right? He is free. He's not a slave in many respects. He's not owned physically, right? If he was owned, then that would make his preaching questionable, right? There's an underlying reason for him to be preaching. If he's not beholden to wealthy patrons, he's not beholden to the, the patrons of the traveling speakers and the philosophers of Corinth, if he was on their pace, their, 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 um, uh, if they, he was being paid by these people, then it would be questionable what he was preaching. But he's not being paid by these people. He's completely self, self-supported. But he says he acts like a servant to all. So he's not a servant to any of these people. He's not paid by them. But shocker, he acts like he is. He acts like he's a servant to all these people. And he does this for the purpose of winning more of them through the gospel. The word everyone there, it's literally all people, all people. But he clarifies by listing these groups of people that he's specifically thinking about, okay? And we've got four different groups of people that he's specifically thinking about. Also, this strategy of, of becoming like a slave to influence and save others, it's, it's actually pretty countercultural then, and pretty countercultural now. In our context, like if you think of an employee employer relationship, we think of the employer influencing the employee. In 1 Corinthians 3 18 through 20, we're reminded that the wisdom of this world is folly with God. See, he has established that love and service reach people's hearts, not power and wealth. However, Uh, Paul acknowledges that he can't cause everyone to be saved. Even by serving them and loving them and becoming all things to all people, he acknowledges he can't save all of them. He just says more of them, right? And so he's pointing to God's sovereignty. He is doing all that he can by the power of the Holy Spirit to reach out to these people, to to give up his rights, but he's acknowledging that it's, it's God's sovereignty that will call people. Paul is seeking to become like these four groups of people. He's seeking to become like the Jews, right? He calls out the Jews. He's ta- he calls out those under the law, which are primarily Jews. Uh, those apart from the law, which prim- primarily be Gentiles. And the weak. And we, we just talked about the weak in chapter 8, but we think that this is probably a different group of the weak. It seems uh, that this is probably the weak in society because of the, the references here. It seems kind of odd for a Jew to say that he is becoming like a Jew, right? For Paul to say that he is going to give up his rights to become like a Jew seems really weird because he is a Jew. Um, But Paul took on the aspects of the Jewish culture and the law that he didn't have to. He didn't have to take those on as he was serving Christ and under the law of Christ. He didn't have to take those things on, but he took them on um, to be acceptable to the Jews, 
to be acceptable to those that were under the law, those that had to celebrate different celebrations, those that had to eat different foods. He took those things on to be like them so that he could be in their presence and acceptable to them so that he could preach the gospel to them and they would listen to him. The outward appearance that Paul put on looked the same as a Jew and a law follower, but in his heart, he knew that he was voluntarily doing these things out of love for the people, love for his neighbor. He wasn't trying to earn favor with God. He wasn't trying to earn his salvation by following the law. He was giving up his right to not have to follow the law in order to be who these people needed to talk to them. To those apart from the law, the Gentiles, he took on their customs and practices. However, and, and be careful, this is, this is the interesting one. Um, to those apart from the law, right, he took on their customs and practices, but he didn't become lawless. They were apart from the law, but he didn't become lawless. He took on their customs, those things that he could do and still submit to God. He recognized and he says this, he, he recognized the lordship of Christ. He was still a servant of Christ. He still submitted to Christ in this. And finally, he says that he became as the weak. And we said the weak are the weak of, in society. Without putting on their particular sins, right? That weakness may drive them to, to desperation or without putting those things on, he became like them. He associated with them. He experienced life as a weak person to be with them. Notice that Paul never becomes the strong to save the strong. It's an interesting thing that we don't see him becoming the strong to save the strong. We see him always seeking to target the persecuted and the down and out, the outcast of society. And to each people group he encountered, he took on their culture to the extent that was helpful to them. Right, to the extent that he could and still be a follower of Christ. And this required versatility and flexibility that may have led to persecution and suffering with those groups of people. But it opened doors for the gospel. He made friends with these people and were able to share with them the gospel of Christ. Notice that Paul adds on to his statement in verse 17 above. Let's read verse 17 again so we don't forget where we're at. For I do this of my own will, uh, for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward that in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel? Sorry, verse 8. Not to make full use of my right in the gospel. He's saying that he is, he is making use of some of his rights as an apostle, just not the ones he's giving up to become like these groups, right? He's talking about his full use of rights. And so he is still exercising rights. He's not denying all of his rights. He's not um, uh, giving up everything. He's giving up targeted things to become like these people so that he can preach to them and he'll, they will accept him. So exercising rights is not inherently wrong. Paul is targeting each group and considering how he can become like them to enable preaching the gospel. But now is the time for us to ask the question, but what about pleasing God rather than man? What about pleasing God rather than man? And in Galatians 1.10, we read, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. This is Paul writing. The same, the same Paul is writing this. He's saying, am I, you know, should I be worried about pleasing man? No, 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 no. I shouldn't be. I should be worried about pleasing Christ alone. So how, is, how do we balance these two things? Becoming all things to all people and I'm not worried about pleasing them. I'm worried about pleasing Christ. He's clear that in becoming all things to all people, he's not compromising the gospel. It's still as offensive as ever. The gospel is an offense to people, that they would be sinners and that they would need someone to pay for their sin. And he does not compromise on the gospel. Paul's talking about areas that are neutral to God, like 
maybe customs for food or clothing or social norms, maybe some of their entertainment where it doesn't cross a line, maybe hobbies, maybe music, right? He's talking about uh, ways that he can give up his preferences in order to be like a group of people to reach them. But never water down the gospel. Never allow idolatry. Never stray from one God. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, became like us to save us, but he didn't compromise with our sin. Paul talks about this relationship with the law in three ways. He says, though not being myself under the law, and he's talking about the Old Testament law there, the law of Moses, and he says, not being outside the law of God, so he's inside the law of God, and he says, but under the law of Christ. So three different things he talks about the law here. And in becoming all things to all people, he's not under the ceremonial law. He's not under the, the legal aspects of the law of the Old Testament, which can't earn salvation. It's maintaining the moral law of God. He's staying under the law of Christ, right? And what is the law of Christ? The law of Christ is summed up in a single word. It's summed up in, in love. Christ says, love God and love man are the two greatest commandments. All of the moral law hangs on these two points. And so Paul is saying, I, yeah, I'm, I'm still there. That's, that's what I've been called to do. I'm under the law of Christ. But I'm not under these other law. I'm, I'm being like these people, but I'm not, I'm, I have no like, um, thought in my mind that I'm earning anything by following these laws. So Paul is clearly showing that exercising our rights can hinder the gospel. And now he's saying that abstaining from our rights could aid the gospel. So how, how do we think about applying these things to our life? How do we decide if we're going to abstain or if we're going to exercise our rights? How do we walk through that? We're not Paul. We're not apostles. How do we process these things? And so the next verses are really helpful in that. And so, number three, the, the proper perspective as we exercise and or abstain from our rights. The proper perspective as we exercise and or abstain from our rights. You know, in, in challenging times like we find ourselves and like as, as the days grow on and we're in these end times and it gets closer to the end times, understanding how to do this in our culture, understanding how to exercise or abstain from our rights is critical. God wants us to reach our communities. He wants us to reach out to them. And part of the way that we do that is by abstaining from our rights and our preferences sometimes. And so understanding how to do that is, is what we're going to talk about here in verses 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified." These last four verses are transitioning. Not only are they addressing the topic in, in chapter 9, but they're transitioning to chapter 10. And chapter 10 is further warnings about idolatry. So, uh, so Paul is, is warning about being controlled in a society that's surrounded by idols. He's warning about that also in this. Um, Paul uses here a picture of a runner at the games. The Isthmian Games was one of four athletic and musical games in Greece. And they were held at the Isthmus of Corinth. So just right there by Corinth. They would have been very familiar with this image of an athletic uh, a runner, right? Very common. Lots of people would be practicing and disciplining their bodies. And, and society in general looked up to these athletes uh, because they were so self-disciplined. They worked so hard to, to achieve, you know, victory in, in the games. Um, Paul is saying that we should live our spiritual lives in such a way that we get the prize, right? He's saying that we should live spiritually like these athletes live physically. We should live spiritually in order to get the prize. He's not saying that we earn our salvation, and he's not saying that only one person gets saved. 
And so be that first person. He's not saying that. But he's saying run in this way that you are trying hard and you are serving God with all of your heart like you're trying to achieve the prize. He's he's saying that we should be living in full obedience to Christ. Self-restraint or self-control is the deciding factor in the preparation of a great athlete, just as it is in the life of a Holy Spirit-empowered Christian. We're not talking about a life of self-flagellation or beating our own body. We're talking about abstaining from sin and engaging in spiritual disciplines. Foregoing our immediate satisfaction for long-term growth and health. And I'll tell you, that's directly applicable in our culture today. We, ha- we live in a hedonistic society that runs after pleasure and excess. And Paul here is saying, be self-controlled. Be self-controlled. We've probably all heard stories of athletes that have sacrificed all to get to the top. They've sacrificed their family life. They've sacrificed any other pursuits. They sacrificed everything to get to the top of their sport. And he says that they do it for a perishable crown. At the Ismian Games, the victors, they got a crown. Do you know what that crown was made of? It was weaved of withered celery. It was a perishable crown. It was already perished, right? It was a perishable crown. But the Christian life is targeting an imperishable crown. Our life is targeting crown of life. There's nothing greater that we can achieve, and we're not doing it on our own. But but there's nothing more, there's nothing greater that we can work for in our life than drawing others to the gospel, drawing others to Christ. In verse 27, Paul does not suppose that a believer can lose his or her salvation. It seems like maybe he's saying that here in 27. But I discipline my body to keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. He's not saying that we can lose our salvation. It's clear that he's not because Paul in multiple places says that salvation is by faith alone. It's not by works. So we can't boast about it, right? So he's not saying that we can lose our salvation. He's saying, run in a way that you're not worried about that. Run in a way that you are serving God with all of your heart. And that's not even in the back of your mind. We see the same kinds of warnings in Hebrews chapter 5, right? Live life in a way that that's not one of your concerns because you are serving with everything that you've got. That's what Paul's saying here. It's in this disciplined service, knowing our Bibles, praying without ceasing, being in fellowship with other believers, that we learn to listen and wait and discern which rights we should wisely put off, right? It's in running with diligence, listening to the word of God, praying with all of our heart unceasingly, being in fellowship with other believers, listening to wise counsel, That's how we learn when to put things off, when we should become like like a group of people to to reach out and minister to them. So it's this disciplined life that leads us there and answers those questions. So as we we think about these things, I've got a couple of of, um, applications really for us to think through to help guide our thoughts as we're considering, okay, what does this look like in my life today? What, what rights do I need to be putting off? What preferences do I need to change in order to reach out to my neighbors? You know, none of us are apostles. And very few of us are, are preachers. But we're all commissioned to go to the world with the gospel. So this isn't something that's just for a few of us. This is really for all of us. We're all called to take the gospel to the nations. And that starts right here in Brighton, Right? And so these things, being effective with the gospel, are really important for us to think through clearly. If by maintaining our rights and exercising our preferences, we're putting a stumbling block before the gospel, then we need to change those things. They're, they may, they're not sin, but if we're putting a stumbling block in front of somebody because they're not able to listen to us because of our, our, 
uh, exercise of rights, then we need to change those things. All right. So we're all servants of God, and we don't deserve a reward in exchange for serving him. You know, when, when, um, when I don't deserve to be paid for something, I'm just obligated to, to do it. Uh, like, like me, you may approach service uh, that, that's obligated with reluctance, right? It's not necessarily the funnest thing. But we actually need to approach this with engagement and energy. I mean, when we were singing in our service just now, like, the gospel is amazing. God's love for us, we don't deserve it. We're sinners. We deserve death. We hear that a lot, but like, let that sink in. Like, we deserve to go to hell. But he saved us, and he saved us at great personal cost. And if he saved us by sending his son to die an ugly death, then can't we serve him? Shouldn't that be our life goal? Shouldn't we be willing to give up a style of clothing or a type of food and take on something else so that we can reach the world for, for his sake? And that's, that we should be excited about that. Excited about what we can do to change so that we can be more effective in our gospel ministry. Have you considered your exercise of liberties and rights? And have you considered maybe which of your uh, preferences could be causing a stumbling block to those outside the church? Think about that. What am I doing? What do I like doing in, in the COVID world or just in general? Like, is something that I'm eating that's not halal, is that causing some Muslim at work a lot of problems and they can't listen to me because they can't get past that? Could I change and just eat like them at work so that uh, they would be willing to listen to me? Well, I mean, that's just a, it's just a preference. We can give those things up. We can take on things, right? Not because they earn us anything, but so that people are able to listen to us. We all interact with groups of people, right? God's put people in our life, put people in our path. He's, he's placed you in contact with your family and your friends and your coworkers. He's placed you in between your neighbors, right? And he's done that on purpose. What can you do to remove stumbling blocks by your preferences to reach out to those people? We're not talking about going to the, to the Middle East or going to China. We're talking about here with your neighbors and your coworkers. What can you do to eliminate stumbling blocks for them? You know, maybe it's other faith groups. Maybe, maybe someone that you know is, is a Muslim or, or a Mormon or a Catholic or uh, some other faith group, right? What can you do to practice things so that, that they can listen to you? And they're not offended by you. Maybe it's other ideologies. Maybe it's a different political ideologies. Maybe it's different social or, or, or racial ideologies. Or um, maybe there's, you know, really hard things because you feel passionate about this. But what can you do to eliminate barriers so that you can speak into these situations? What are you willing to give up so that you can preach the gospel to people around you. Becoming all things to all people is, is really a calling to walk a tightrope as well. You know, if you fall off to the one side, then you're not doing enough to become like those around us and you're constructing obstacles for them. And if you fall off the other side of this tightrope, you're becoming too much like the world, right? And we don't want to do that. So we're walking this tightrope as we're trying to, to find ways to, to eliminate barriers for people. John Piper asked two questions to really help us assess the balance of becoming all things to all people with obeying the law of Christ. Two questions. I want you to, to remember these. The first is, are you becoming more worldly minded than they're becoming spiritually minded? In your relationships with people, 
as you're seeking to remove obstacles so that you can preach the gospel into their lives, are you becoming more worldly minded than they're becoming spiritually minded? And if so, consider that you may not be under the law of Christ anymore. The second one is, is your passion for winning your friends and family growing or is it shrinking as you become all things to them? And if it's shrinking, then you're not in the law of Christ at that point anymore. So be careful to check your heart. Be careful to, to consider these things as you are seeking to remove obstacles for the people around you. We need to be exercising self-control over our rights and freedoms, willing to give them up for the sake of the gospel. And these sacrifices may look different for each one of us, right? What I need to do to remove an obstacle for a friend is going to look different than what you need to do to remove an obstacle for a family member. And we're not going to hold each other to the same set of, of, of removing obstacles, right? God's calling us into unique situations. They're not it's not a law that each of us give up the same thing, right? We have freedom in that. But we need to be willing to give these things up in unique ways in the places that God has called us to. The theme of sacrifice for the sake of the gospel should be consistent in all of our lives. Willing to give things up, giving things up, reaching the world around us because the days are short. The witness of our body to the community around us in these last days is about the glory of God. We are compelled, brothers and sisters, to give up our rights for the sake of reaching our neighbors without giving up our obedience to God. Paul has indicated that exercising our rights might hinder the gospel and that abstaining from our rights might aid the gospel. So let's, let's abstain from our rights the ones that are right. Let's abstain from those to aid the gospel. We've considered how our commitment to spiritual disciplines will make us able to decide what the best path forward is. So let's remember what the main point of our passage is today. We need to consider the rights that we engage in from the perspective of the gospel's advance and be willing to abstain from those rights if it's helpful for those seeking God. Will you pray with me? Lord, we need help in this. We're, we're selfish people. We want what we want and we enjoy our special things. We, we enjoy the things that you've given us that are, uh, that are allowable and that are good. And we don't want to give those things up. We've even worked through our consciences in order to, to become mature enough to, to realize that some of these things are okay. And we don't want to turn around then and, and, and stop practicing some things. But God, you are great and highly to be praised. And your gospel deserves to go out because you deserve worshipers from every nation and every tongue and every tribe. You deserve men and women to bend their knee to you. God, give us wisdom as we engage with our neighbors and our coworkers and our family and our friends, as we engage with them to remove obstacles from their understanding of, of the gospel. Give us strength to do that. Give us discipline to be in your word and in prayer. Cause us to bring you glory, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's spend a few moments just considering these things, and then the worship team will come back up.
as we commit to live in obedience to the Lord no matter the cost, we respond in singing and in giving. We'll sing together, Take My Life. As we've heard these words, strong words about how to live from the Apostle Paul, listen to these words by the same Apostle. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Go with these words.